Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon. Uh, good news is that a lot of the previous talks covered what I was going to talk about for some of the slides, so we'll breeze right through them. Hopefully, this is quick and easy to understand for everyone. But this is about the Gemini dollar. I work at Gemini. Uh, by the way, we just released a mobile app yesterday, which is very exciting. Did anyone get a chance to play with it yet? Recommend. Thank you. Great. I recommend you all download it. Uh, if you haven't, I'm, I'm thrilled about that. That was a really highly demanded thing for a while, and it's finally out. So I'm a security engineer at Gemini. I'm on the core development team of the Gemini Dollar, and I used to work at uh, Mandiant right here in New York before that, doing pen testing, IR, forensics, that kind of deal. So what's the Gemini Dollar? It's an ERC-20 token, the stable coin, which means it's backed one-to-one -one by the US dollar, and it's regulated. Now, all these different words here are very important in designing the Gemini Dollar. It's not just one, it's all three of these things. But how do you do that the right way? So ERC-20 contracts are common, right? You should know this like the back of your hand if you're interested in Ethereum. Total supply, balance of, transfer, approve, transfer from, et cetera. That's common. What's special about it? Regulated stablecoin is not as common. We were one of the first that come, came up with this. So what are some unique things about being a regulated stablecoin that makes your design of an ERC-20 contract unique? So number one, most ERC-20 contracts you see are just one big contract, right? They've got the interface implemented. So total supply, you call one contract, that contract has the code to return the total supply. That same contract has all the balances. That same contract has all the approvals, everything. Gemini Dollar, meanwhile, is three contracts. I'll get into why that is soon. Printing and burning. If you participated in a token sale, bless your heart, those tokens, uh, they have kind of an arbitrary means of printing and burning. They've got their own rules. The owners of that token will say, we're going to print if this happens or if we want to pay someone. We'll burn if the price goes uh, down too low, that kind of thing, right? Gemini dollar, it's defined when we print and burn. We don't just kind of decide willy-nilly. It's printed upon withdrawal from Gemini Exchange, and it's burned upon you depositing that Gemini dollar back into Gemini Exchange and redeeming fiat. So when you go to Gemini.com and you do withdraw from Gemini Exchange, they actually create a Gemini dollar for you. They'll provide an Ethereum address, we'll send you an ERC-20 token, that's the Gemini dollar, and we'll debit your account a fiat dollar. And that token is then created at, uh, in that instance. Your Ethereum address that you withdrew to now has a Gemini dollar. That's the creation process. And when you want to redeem that Gemini dollar for a real US dollar, you deposit it back in, and the burn function is called in our contract. Ultimately, it gets burned. So a limit to printing. Again, most tokens have the ability to print an unbounded amount. It's just got a print function, right? We impose something called a total supply ceiling for security purposes, and I'll explain how that works briefly as well. But we can't just print an arbitrary amount. So if our hot wallet, God forbid, got compromised, there's a limit to what could actually happen with respect to Gemini dollars. They can't just print billions willy-nilly. There's a ceiling. And to adjust that ceiling requires multiple signatures from our cold and cryogenic, geographically separated offline sites. And number four is transparency. So regulated stablecoins have an obligation to deal with illicit activity because they're regulated. So regulated means the New York Department, Financial, uh, Department of Financial Services basically considers this as much a dollar as a physical dollar in your hand, right? And what that means is that the obligation of someone who's issuing a regulated stablecoin like this has the same obligation that, say, a bank would have. A bank wouldn't take in clearly laundered money, illicit money. So how do you do that the right way, transparently? How do you implement that kind of security, that kind of regulation to a smart contract in a transparent way so uh, it's done so everyone understands what's happening? Let's talk about that. Number one, I mentioned we have three contracts. Why do we have that? Number one, say we have changes to our business logic. Not only is there the ERC-20 standard that's implemented, but the Gemini dollar also contains Gemini-specific business logic in it. And if we were to change our Gemini-specific business logic behind the scenes, we wouldn't want to disrupt everyone else's token experience, transferring Gemini dollars from one account to another. So here's an example of that business logic that could change over time. Once Gemini dollars are deposited to a Gemini exchange address, so when you sign up for a Gemini account, you have an Ethereum address associated with your account that you can see that's yours forever. When you deposit token, uh, uh, Gemini dollar into that, uh, you'll get credited with a dollar in your account. 
But what we do, because we control these Ethereum addresses, because we have actually the keys to these, we want to consolidate all the Gemini dollars that go into these addresses and send them to a single house account. We do that with this sweep mechanism uh, because if we were to just take all of those individual Ethereum addresses and issue a transfer call from each, that's really gas inefficient. Uh, same, same thing with if we did approve and transfer from. Basically, we needed to come up with a way to consolidate all the Gemini dollars sent to exchange addresses to send them all into one house account. And because this is inefficient, the built-in ERC-20 functions are inefficient. So that's what it would look like. If you wanted to deposit into your uh, redeem for a fiat dollar, you do it like this. You go to Gemini dollar, deposit and convert. And what would happen behind the scenes is us calling this enable sweep function. So this is the gas efficient way of moving these Gemini dollars to the house account. Instead of requiring each individual address to issue a transfer manually every time, what if there was a way they could sign a message saying, from here on out, I'm going to give you approval to move my balance, sweep my balance to this house account. And that's what we came up with. So we sign a message that says, from here on out, I allow you to sweep my balance. So in one of the contracts, we have this sweep message. This is the message that I was talking about earlier. When one of these Ethereum addresses signs the word sweep concatenated with the address of the contract, then they are essentially allowing their balance to be swept. Uh, and here's that enable sweep function. You'll see that we take an array of signatures and a destination address. And if we can EC recover, if we can see for sure that they did in fact sign the sweep message, then what we're going to do is we're going to add them to that swept set uh, array right there and say, okay, these people want to be swept. They don't have to formally call transfer for us to sweep their balance anymore. Uh, and you can see that this function can only be called by the sweeper. You'll see that modifier at the end, which means that no one else in the world can do it besides us in the first place. So no one is in danger of accidentally having their balances swept. But anyway, once they do that, this allows us to consolidate those balances on the exchange on our end. So after they've enabled the sweep, any subsequent sweep can then be replayed. Again, this doesn't require the private keys of those Ethereum addresses anymore after they've enabled that sweep doesn't require individual transfers every time. It just requires this one call to enable sweep. And then from then on out, um, the house account can just call, hey, please replay sweep for all these different addresses here. And what we'll do is we'll check. We'll make sure they belong to that swept set, which means they've already signed this message. And if so, we're going to consolidate all those balances and put it into the house account. So that was an example of business logic that has nothing to do with your experience transferring tokens, right? You guys are doing transfer, approve, sending it on the blockchain. But that stuff that I just mentioned is just Gemini specific. That's just how we consolidate things. If we were to change that, we wouldn't want to have to migrate all the balances from people and uh, issue a new contract. So it's upgradability that I'm getting at. And I'll explain how that works. Number two, being a real US dollar, like I mentioned, we've got the obligation to act on clearly illicit activity. So we needed a mechanism uh, to do that the right way. That's another reason we did three contracts. And that'll make sense soon, too. So if we were to implement the Gemini dollar as one large contract, any update to that contract, for example, our business logic or something else, would require creating a new Gemini dollar contract, you know, issuing it on chain, migrating all the existing balances from our old contract to the new contract, and then telling every single exchange about that new contract address and hoping they update things quickly, right? That's not ideal. So it's extremely high friction. So I'm going to kind of breeze through this part because we've heard about upgradability many times. It was well, well explained. Uh, this is a post from Trail of Bits. Uh, delegate call was one option for upgradability. And we know that this is a low level call and it's risky. Uh, this is another slide directly from Trail of Bits. Thank you for the. I'm allowed to plagiarize you guys. Um, it's risky. It's low level. Uh, it's not easily testable, too, so we didn't want to do this. So our solution was three contracts like this. Every inbound uh, transaction starts with this ERC-20 proxy contract, which then calls this impl contract, which then calls this store contract. So. ERC-20 proxy is like an eternal contract. It's published to the Ethereum mainnet once, and that's never going to change. 
the address you see for that ERC-20 proxy contract is going to be the same until you're dead. Because we're not changing it, we're not doing anything with it. All it does is it implements the methods of, uh, it implements the prototypes of the ERC-20 standard, and it exposes them to the outside world. So any transfer, anything having to do with uh, the ERC-20 standard will start here 100% of the time. All it does is that it says, okay, thank you for starting with me. I'm going to pass this off to Impl. Impl is going to take care of the rest. So it always starts a proxy. That's never going to change because the ERC-20 standard is final. So when you call any function in proxy, it immediately calls Impl with the arguments you provided. So this is what transfer looks like in proxy. No logic. So that's the prototype you're used to, right? Transfer to a destination address, this value, right? Behind the scenes, you don't need to worry about this. Proxy is just saying, okay, Impl, this is what this person wanted to do. Please take care of it and turn true or false, whatever. So Impl is the logical contract. Impl is the one that would check the balances are sufficient, for example, in a transfer call. Um, and this is where the business logic lives as well. So when proxy receives that transfer function call, it calls Impl with those arguments immediately, and Impl only will respect calls from proxy. Impl will not respond to any other contract in the world. So this is what gets called. So proxy just said, okay, I'm gonna pass this off to Impl. Impl's gonna take care of everything. Impl then has this transfer with sender function. So all that happened is we took the arguments, the two, uh, the destination address and the value, we pass it to this function, as well as the address of the sender of that function to the proxy contract. So, so if, I, if I said I want to transfer to this person right here, and I sent that to proxy, proxy says, okay, this person wants to send to that person this value, Impl, please check the logic of that. This is kind of the logic you're familiar with. We're checking the balances are sufficient, we're making sure everything's okay. So again, this is only proxy. This function can only be called by the proxy. So that's why you have to start at proxy, and then you get to impl. This is the only way you can make a transfer. Now store is actually the contract that's holding the balances. This is the state. Uh, the most stateful contract is store. It's got the balances and it's got the approvals. So only impl can modify the values in store. So if a user wanted to transfer tokens, they'd start at proxy, which would then call impl. Impl would read the values in store, and if the balances are sufficient, it would then say, okay, store, let's modify that. So let me go back to impl for a second. You'll see how it's checking that the balances are sufficient is by reading that value from ERC20 store. It says UN256 balance of sender is ERC20 store dot balances of sender. And that's where it does the check. So all these approvals, all these balances are actually held in the store contract. So balance of is just querying store, set balance right there is setting the value in store, add balance is setting the value in store, everything is actually stored in store. That should make sense. So this is what that function looks like in store. It can only be called by impl and it just literally does what it's told. Set balance of owner to new balance. So the logic was done in Impl. Impl said, I'm going to make sure the balances are sufficient. And if so, then I'm going to call this function set balance in store, and store just does it. Store doesn't need to check anything anymore. Impl already did that for it. And store can only have its functions called by Impl. That's kind of the chain uh, that takes place here. So this is the key part. You can kind of see where I'm getting with this. Why did we design it this way? Because upgrading the contracts is as simple as modifying pointers in proxy and store, like this. The original impl, let's say it was uh, it was impl one, right? That was the original impl. You had that chain going from proxy to impl to store. All we do when we need to modify our business logic or something like that is we swap out that middle contract. So. The interface of the ERC-20 contract is the same. You'll still interact with that proxy contract. You start there. Those are exposed functions of the ERC-20 standard. You'll always start there. It'll pass through a new intermediate contract called Impl, and the balances are still where they were. We didn't have to migrate anything. This new Impl will then point to the existing store. This new Impl will point to the, 
the, uh, the, the proxy will point to the new impl, impl will point to the existing store. The new chain is formed like that. And you notice that we didn't have to migrate any balances, change anything like that. So that's the idea. Uh, so how do you modify the, uh, these pointers? It's not that easy, actually. It requires a custodian contract. And the custodian is another smart contract that requires multiple unique signatures, like I mentioned, from our cold and cryogenic geographically separated offline sites. So this is, this is the process of doing that. We also have a time lock. So if we wanted to change one of these contracts, like Impl, swap it out for another one, we can't just change it immediately. We have to submit the request to do that. And there's actually a time lock enforced such that that can actually go into effect for uh, an order of hours, days, or weeks, depending on how severe of a change it is. And you can see that enforced by, by, the, by the smart contract. So we can't just spring something up on anyone. It's a time lock. Everyone can see what the proposed change is before that. Uh, yeah, so we've seen other, other stable coins uh, rely on delegate call. We've seen other stable coins uh, provide admin access to just one external account rather than having a smart contract controlled by several different Ethereum addresses. Uh, so there are some uh, concerns with that. We think that this is kind of the right way to do it, and it's kind of transparent, and uh, we're, we're proud of our designs. We actually got an audit with Trail of Bits, which we're, we're really pleased with. Uh, yeah, I can skip this part. I'll uh, so testing strategy in doing this, we had a symbolic execution suite uh, leveraging Manicore, uh, property-based testing suite with Echidna, both Trail of Bits tools, which I urge you all to check out if you're interested in that realm. Uh, we had a unit testing suite, obviously. Not only do we check the happy paths, but it's also important to hit every single require statement. Anytime there's a require, you should try to hit it and make it throw. And uh, you'll notice that your eyes play tricks, play tricks on you because you'll catch things you never thought you'd catch in a million years by doing that. Uh, every event, we made sure the output was as expected. And then after we published the contracts, we'd query the blockchain state to make sure all the storage values and all the pointers between the contracts were as expected as well. Uh, this is kind of that truffleized uh, testing suite that we came up with after the um, contracts were deployed uh, as a visual demo. And I'll briefly talk about the limit to printing. We have a print limiter contract that can only be called uh, so confirm print is where printing is done, and it's in that impl contract. And it can only be done by the custodian of that impl contract, and we made that custodian this print limiter contract, which can only call confirm print in a wrapper function. It can't call it unbounded because it's limited by how much it can call. So I'll show you. So this is that confirm print function in that impl contract I showed you. You'll see. Uh, it can just raise the supply, right? If the custodian makes a call, it can confirm the print and it can print to an address. But as I mentioned before, we have a total supply ceiling. And that's uh, managed by this print limiter. So in this print limiter contract, we have this limited printer, an address that controls that, and this total supply ceiling, which can only be changed with multiple signatures from those offline sites that I mentioned. So the print limiter will do a limited print. The only way you can call confirm prints in that impl contract is through this limited print uh, function. So this limited print checks to see that the amount you want to print, even if you have the right address to do it, uh, checks whether that exceeds that total supply ceiling that I talked about. So this is kind of a wrapper that you can't get around. You have to call this limited print, and this limited print will stop you from printing above that total supply ceiling. So right now, I think there's like 88 million Gemini dollars out there in the ether. Total supply ceiling is something like 120 million right now. So if someone got control of our hot wallet address, for example, and tried to print, they couldn't hit above 120 uh, million because of this function right here. Uh, so I wanted to be quick. That was it. Uh, a lot of this was already covered. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.